The Athletic. The race is on. Last week we tackled the drivers, but this week it's all about the teams in our second 2023 F1 season review podcast as we grade all 10 teams based on their achievements versus expectations. But who was a pleasant surprise and who was a bitter disappointment? I'm Ed Straw and joining me to weigh up the hits and misses of the season are Ben Anderson and Scott Mitchell Mound. Ben, welcome. The last podcast recording of the year. Hello, Ed. Is it? Wow, okay. Uh, what, what a year it's been. Do we look back on our podcast highlights together or do we just quickly move on? It all just merges into one, doesn't it? Just one, one, endlessly one giant on. podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's what people are here for. Absolutely. Well, that's what podcast format's all about. And Scott Mitchell Malm, you're a champion of that particular format, aren't you? <laughs> don't, I don't, 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 don't really know how to take that. Well, what are you implying, Ed? <laughs> I think you should take it badly. Yeah, well, obviously, you've said something to me on the podcast, so I'm going to take it badly. Yeah, and that's uh, that's only right. But so I must admit, because we're at that sort of time of year where people uh, post how much they've been listening to stuff on uh, on Spotify. And I, I'm very appreciative of it, but I'm slightly alarmed to see that people have been listening to us for like days of their life this year. It's um, it, it's very much appreciated, but they must <laughs> exactly. be so bored. <laughs> How, how how would you how would you grade our podcast performances this year, Ed? Surely that's going to be your job. The letters don't. There's not enough letters in the alphabet to go that low. <laughs> <laughs> not enough minuses either. So, oh, uh, ouch. Yeah, the, the the teams will be doing better in in this particular one. So let's let's get on with it. We're going to talk through the ten teams in reverse championship order and give them a grade. And it's not based purely on how many points they score, because obviously going into the season, there's different different expectations for different teams, and a good season for one team in terms of results might be a bad season for another so Ben we're going to start off with Haas 10th in the Constructors Championship and we have gone with a rather dismal E for Haas E is that the lowest we can go we could go E minus but we I could feel go E minus no I, I, I think I feel okay. like they were trying e- <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair uh yeah E minus is maybe a bit harsh but I mean you know they 10th in the championship this year as you said 8th compared to 8th the season before, they only scored one point across the final 13 races. So I think that really hurts them because from second half of the season on, they were just going backwards, finished poorly. 25 fewer points scored despite a stronger driver lineup. I think it's fair to say Nico Hulkenberg's return was probably the only triumph for that team compared to having crash-prone Mick Schumacher. But overall, they were much less competitive they were closer to Alfa Romeo than they were in 2022 in terms of points scored. So you could argue, and maybe we will, that Alfa are slightly worse in terms of their regression. Um, but nevertheless, I would say, yeah, has one of the most regressive teams this season, not helped by Williams and Alfa Tauri eventually taking a decent step forward. Hulkenberg obviously started to lose patience by the end of the season at the lack of progress so much stock placed in this major Red Bull inspired upgrade that they chucked all the money. Supposedly they had more money to spend as well because the money ground deal meant they were pushing up to the budget cap at last, chucked it all into this one massive upgrade for their home race, Austin, and the car was no quicker. I think slightly better at low speed, but worse in high speed. So balanced out at no real gain. You would think having the fundamental Ferrari architecture would mean a decent platform to exploit, but they haven't been able to do it. Um, questions about the the level of investment from the ownership and as F1 moves into this kind of billion dollar plus mega franchises backed by manufacturers era has kind of increasingly looks like it's out on its own as a as a, a, a sort of platform that doesn't really make sense actually in the way F1 is going so um, at least they had some decent qualifying form in the car 10 Q3 appearances I think it was so I think that kind of made you feel like they were a bit stronger than they actually were because Hulkenberg was quite consistently banging it in the top 10, but of course just going backwards in the races. So really this felt, I guess, in the end, more like a season closer to the end of 2019 than than one of their best. Well, the fundamental problem they had was they weren't finding improvements performance-wise in the wind tunnel and they took way too long before they made a change because actually throwing a big upgrade on the car it not yielding instant results isn't necessarily a big problem. They'll have learned a lot from it. It'll feed into next year. They should 
be better off, say, in March next year than they would have been if they hadn't done that. But, Scott, it was that extraordinarily long period of time where they were just not finding anything. And the reason their mark really is so low is because this team spent so long getting absolutely nowhere with the the, the design and development work at a base. It just wasn't yielding performance gains in the wind tunnel, which you've got to react to. And if you're going to sit there for months doing that, it's just flat-footed. Well, sometimes the championship standings lie, but they don't in, in this case. <laughs> Haas was, was the worst team in 2023. And I think the only thing that saves... like it, it's It's not... F territory because I think for a modern F1 team well it's not to get F territory because we're not allowed to go that low I clarified that <laughs> well, well no we can we can, can we? no one failed but oh. no one failed like no one outright no one F I think is like Williams 2019 territory yeah, where you be cast to drift miles at the back yeah at, or has 2020 uh no I don't even think has 2020 because has didn't start that season with a slow illegal and late car <laughs> so so yeah like Williams 2019 is your benchmark for an f yeah um, okay this is this is an e because it's like they built one of they built probably the fifth or sixth fastest car in f1 the problem is that car could only do about one and a half laps before it rooted its tires and yeah. then it went backwards so th- there were there were elements of the half season that were, were were okay so it wasn't a total write-off and you 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 raised ben the the addition of Hulkenberg and his performances was is a good example of of that. But the peaks were really, really isolated to Saturday. Yeah. Um, and they were few and far between in the second half of the year. You mentioned the barren points run in the second half of the, the season, one in 13, I think. Yeah. So it was just... It, it was just pretty miserable because of that lack of development, how slow they were, and the fact that that Austin upgrade, which Magnussen sort of talked about afterwards as, a, as like, a, oh, we didn't really, I didn't expect big things from it. Steiner had talked it up as the biggest upgrade they've ever done in season. But I think what they realised is that you're just layering on, theoretically, a better aerodynamic package onto a fundamentally flawed platform. So they were just never going to get anything extra out of it late on. And I suspect also that the aerodynamic stuff didn't quite work as well as they really hoped it would either. So it was just it was just a, a miserable season. And, and I do agree with one of the points Ben made, which is I, I, I fear F1 is moving away from what Gene Haas has allowed this team to drift into being. Yeah, they definitely need to maximise their investment to expand or they're going to miss their opportunity. Let's move on to Sauber now, who finished ninth in the championship. Scott, we've gone with an E for them as well. Yeah, this is um, a, it's a slightly different kind of E season um, <laughs> in that uh, I feel like it's fair to have had higher expectations of Sauber than it is of Haas because of one thing you can say in mitigation for Haas is it is a unique set up and it is the smallest team and it probably does have the lowest season of all 10 teams at the moment if you if every team performs to its maximum so Sauber did slightly better overall but I would expect them to so it's a relative level of uh, underachievement they did more but I expected more of them and again a lot of talk over the winter a lot of, yeah, we've changed a lot on the car, stuff we couldn't do in season in 2022. So we're really looking forward to getting in and getting most of that. And I think by mid-season, Valtteri Bottas has said that none of the targets had been hit in terms of, I guess, aerodynamic performance, outright downforce and load, but also aerodynamic efficiency because it's one of the slowest cars on the straight pretty much all season until a late upgrade improved things. Um, Bottas himself... Um, we took a few trips to Valtteri Bottas' Sympathy Corner through the year, um, our memories. And Valtteri, I think, actually did quite a good job in 2023. Ed's spoken at length, actually, about the times that Bottas has done well and been unrewarded because the car's not been very competitive. But Joe Guan Yu had, I would say, a slightly less impressive second season in F1 than he actually did a rookie season because I think he proved a few people wrong about him in season one, but didn't really kick on much in season two so you only really had one side of the garage properly performing in a car that really struggled to perform it was so it was just a it was a very underwhelming season and a very underwhelming farewell to the faux manufacturer Alfa Romeo entry yeah and ultimately this team can aspire to do better can't it Ben it it should be a slightly more consistent point scorer and the other thing is on track there were times when they had pace but just didn't capitalize on it as well 
Yeah, they to me they're perhaps marginally more disappointing than Haas were. If we could E minus a team, then I'd probably E minus Alpha, only because they seem to have been on a one way slope from starting really really strongly in the new ground effect area with that light car scoring heavily in the start of 2022, then kind of getting caught up a bit, but still showing flashes. And as Scott explained, they came into this year, I thought quite punchy in their season launch, you know, addressing a lot, supposedly addressing a lot of problems with the 2022 car. I thought they'd be a lot stronger than they were. And yeah, there were some peaks. I think Bottas a bit of a sleeper hit maybe when you reflect on the season in terms of dragging the car into really decent qualifying spots. They were quite competitive in Hungary on Saturday. Vegas, he started high up, didn't he? But there was a mess at the first corner. He had his annual Mexico amazing performance on Saturday and then regression in the race. But poor execution. The team feels like it's just in that holding pattern, you know, the Alpha deal ending, waiting for Audi to come in. There's this kind of no man's land that they're gliding themselves into until Audi get properly stuck in. And I feel like the taps have maybe been turned off in the background and that doesn't help. So the platform that they set for themselves at the start of these rules, they just haven't capitalised on. And as Scott said, and I agree with this, expectations given the infrastructure of that team and how it more closely aligns with what F1's becoming, they should be doing much, much better than they have done. Ed, can I ask you a question about Sauber? Because one of the things that I think Bottas said towards the end of the year was that he felt that the development through the season this year was better and the development rate showed that they'd learned some lessons and were in a better state. I don't think that necessarily showed itself in end product through 2023. But what? how would, how do you view the Sauber trajectory? Did it Did it end in a better place than it maybe got itself into during the year? Well, it ended in a fairly similar place, really. <laughs> I mean, so no. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it was fine at the end of the year. It was, <laughs> you know, the first few weekends for them actually weren't great. So maybe if you take, say, the first four events or something like that, because Miami was the first time they were properly quick. I think they were within about 1% of, of the pace there. That was the fifth weekend of the season. That was the first time they, they got to that kind of level. So... Yeah, there's that. And obviously, you have to remember there's an underlying development rate for the whole field. So they kept pace with that. Uh, so that that's OK. So I, I don't think it was terrible. It's just it's, yeah, again, it comes back to that thing of, yeah, your pace was OK, but it was a bit erratically deployed. And well, it's execution, isn't it? Like, uh, exactly, Bottas yeah. kept alluding to this towards the end of the season. I mean, obviously, everyone is is ride height limited with these cars. But it seemed like whenever the Alpha was really quick it's because they were running it too low and they often had to run it higher to make sure that it would be legal and then it would lose performance or become erratic. So sometimes they would hit a sweet spot on a particular circuit where they could run it as as low or approximately as low as they needed to to access the performance and they'd be quite good. Qatar, I think, was quite a decent example of that. But there are so many other races where they just weren't able to run it in the setup window they needed to. So maybe, maybe overall there was potentially in the car but they just couldn't access it well the bottom line is that performance across a wide range of ride heights is the key to these cars and when you're talking about designing the car and your car concept actually that's quite a big decision what areas what ride heights you're aiming to get the performance at and obviously they're falling short on that but they've got a change of technical director during the season james james keys there now so there's certainly more potential in this team in the short term and then there's the whole wider longer term picture let's move on to alpha tari now who finished eighth in the championship we've gone with d plus for them okay which if we'd done it based on the past the last six or so <laughs> events it would be way higher yeah so what do you make of alpha tari well that that drags them up, doesn't it? Because I would say probably for the first 18 months under the ground effect rules, they were comfortably the worst team in F1. So they'd be maybe an F. So the performances from the second half of the season, Silverstone onwards and particularly Singapore onwards, drags them up to looking quite respectable again. Franz Toss talked in his farewell tour about basically sacking everyone in the aero department, overhauling it and then challenging the new crowd to to bring upgrades to every race and drag them out of the mire. Um, that obviously then raises questions about how can you afford to upgrade the car so aggressively uh, and so late into the season. But 
you know, the performance was there anyway. They outscored Williams 23 17 the second half of the season, Alfa Romeo 23 7. So they they were the best of those teams in kind of Division Three, I think, by the end of the season. Uh, the best car at low speed, I think it was by the end as well. Certainly rivals thought. So impressive that they were able to get to that point, but I think it came at a cost in terms of efficiency. And they, they look a little bit more like the pre-2022 version of the team. You know, not quite able to giant kill like that, but a little bit of a better reflection of that kind of performance rather than just, you know, rooted to the to the back of the grid. Probably they should be looking at aiming to scout Alpine now if they're going to kick on, given that that team just seems to have stagnated. Obviously, they've got the closer cooperation with Red Bull Racing as well, which should help and taking part of taking a suspension upgrade for Singapore that was inspired by the RB19 or utilised some of those parts obviously helped them as well. So I'd probably have them at C plus B level for the final races of the year. And that, I guess, averages out fairly well considering how poor they were for the first year and a half. And as you've written about, Scott, the fact that Alpha Tauri was so strong at the end of the year started to create a few rumblings in the paddock. That's always a good sign for any team that's aligned with another as the, as the lesser team when people start complaining about that it's normally because they're doing well and people are worried. Yeah, it's it's a bit, it was a bit like um, we, we often for a while heard it about Haas and Ferrari, didn't we? That was always the the favoured uh, complaint of McLaren and Renault and, and, and teams like that. I remember one of my um, first, um, when I started covering F1 full time at the start of 2018, one of my first jobs over the Australian Grand Prix weekend was gradually gathering spicy quotes from McLaren, Renault and the like, um, digging into Haas and asking the FIA to look into it and all oh, this performance is magic and blah, blah, blah. And it it's starting to feel a little bit similar now. Obviously, there's always an extra degree of paranoia and scepticism around the Red Bull relationship because it's not just customer and um, supplier. And it is a bit naive and disingenuous for the likes of Christian Horner to kind of just brush it off as just oh it's just exactly the same as any other arrangement and it's down to them to make the most of the tools it will always be looked at differently because it's the only organization that owns two different entries and two different teams so there, there, there's always just even if there's nothing there, there there will just always be extra paranoia about it. so it's just it's a bit wrong to treat it treat it as exactly the same as every, every other situation but when you look at it on the evidence that's in front of you for 2023, everything about what Alpha Tari did did kind of make sense. And there wasn't anything too suspicious about it. Yeah, they had the run of floor upgrades in the second half of the year, which definitely caught people's attention. But by extension, they also didn't really turn up with many spares a lot of the time when they introduced the new floors. I think Austin and Abu Dhabi, they only had the one for each car. So that's a pretty, you know, if you don't have to do a spare for each car, that's a pretty big, not only cost saving, but also time saving as well, because there's the, there's there's less expense in manufacturing and less time spent in production as well. So they didn't crash much either, I don't think, did they? If you compare to some of the other cars at that end of the grid, I don't. I don't remember AlphaTauri racking up huge crash damage no, I bills. I don't think so. Sino- so. Sonoda was much better behaved than he has been in the past. Obviously, Ricardo was a steady pair of hands. Yeah, you, you didn't have and, a Logan Sargent and Lawson situation. Did well. Lawson did well as yeah, well when Lawson he came solid, in and looked yeah. after the car. And the other thing I would say as well is that actually, even when that team was at its worst, and you say like, I think it was more sort of in the first few races floating in sort of like E-grade territory, but... It was, you know, Sonoda was still only just missing out on points yeah. for most of the first phase of the season. Then through the middle of the season, they were waiting for the bigger upgrades to come. So the floor, uh, the, the the rear suspension, the floor stuff like that in the second half of the year. Once that came in, they they they, it, they turned it up again, and they're back to being marginal top ten, grabbing a point here and here and there, or fighting for a point here and there and then you get into that sustained run of upgrades when actually some of the teams that they're fighting with aren't bringing upgrades at all or at the same rate so then they slip from being marginal top 10 to consistently just inside the top 10 it was it was a gradual process it wasn't like they plonked the red bull rear end on it at singapore and then just suddenly went from being q1 exits every weekend to q3 every weekend it was a it was a bit more nuanced than that i think overall despite the low grade you can say they salvaged their season and they've put themselves on a good trajectory. So, yeah, Definitely, very positive yeah. finish. But, yeah, there was a lot of disappointment in the season as well. Let's move on to Williams now. Scott, we've given them a B. They, of course, won that group at the back. But that's quite lofty for a team only in seventh. 
Yes, it is, and um, there are pr- you can make a pretty strong case for for that grade needing to be be lower. But the reason I would advocate a higher grade, as we've um, given given Williams, is one is um, partly versus preseason expectations. I think if you remember that this is a team that axed its team boss and its technical head, and I think its head of aero 12 months ago, it was not in a good place. And you could have argued that the 2023 car would not necessarily have been well born if it was being if it was the result of an organization that then parted company with such senior figures um so there weren't ex- high expectations outside the team or even inside of the team pre-season testing alex alban and he was not putting a front on he wasn't trying to like downplay expectations he was very very honest when he said we think we are last because it did it was a bit of a handful he didn't feel that it was as much of an improvement as it needed to be. Bahrain is the kind of circuit that exposed some of the Williams' weaknesses quite harshly last year. Um, and then he got into the season in, from Bahrain onwards and actually straight out of the blocks, Alban does a great job and, and, and grabs that point. And then actually, with the exception of Australia where he crashed, Alban, I think, got everything that was on the table for Williams this year. Sargent obviously didn't back him up in the way the team needed him to but I think when Albon had those opportunities Williams also nailed it by and large I think they got most of the big calls right they got most of the the setup judgments right in terms of leaning on their strengths and just dealing with their weaknesses so versus pre-season expectations they've overachieved because I'd have had them down to finish last in the championship I'm pretty sure Um, and I also think in terms of execution they did a very good job, which can't be said for every team on the grid as well. So I do think they've had a better than average year, and I think that nudges them up to a B. It's quickly worth noting that they only got one point with the car as it was in its kind of 23 carryover form, by which I mean the 23 regime, and it was the big Canada upgrade they did, which was the result of... Do you mean 22, Ed? Uh, sorry, yeah, the 22 car. Yeah, I'm getting confused about what year it is already. <laughs> but they did the big Canada upgrade, which then triggered a good run and that was the result of some quite different processes in the wind tunnel and that kind of thing so there was a kind of clear change in approach that the new regime brought that actually yielded their best results that was worth mentioning that but Ben's bristling a bit I think not not exactly bristling I don't want to be too harsh on Williams because I think they did have a great season but I didn't feel like the profile of the car changed an awful lot from 2022 I think they did make it better and um, their upgrade in Canada was so good that it impressed Andrea Stella um, he said they must have been doing a good job if it if the car it, with aero if the car could have the kind of traction it showed at that circuit but I like the way that Andrea Stella has become the uh, the the arbiter of who's doing good or bad job up, up and down the pit lane because he's just so, he's just so honest and insightful on this stuff. But right? also, he seems to spend a lot of his time paying attention to the tuggy teams at the back, doesn't he? You know, he's well, like... he's the only one who doesn't lie about paying attention to other teams, isn't Correct, he? Because of course, yeah. that's all any all the technical people do that. But they say, oh no, well we're worried about what we're doing, but they're lying yeah. because they're all looking around to see what they can learn. And he's and I mean, also we know. As we'll get to, I'm sure McLaren has a particular weakness at low speed. So every time he he's particularly praised Alpha Tari for having the best car at low speed by the end of the season, and in this instance, he was praising the Williams for its traction in Canada. So he's obviously looking at those because he's thinking, well, how can we adopt some of that performance onto our own car because we're lacking in that area? But nevertheless, I think Williams was slightly flattered, one by Alex Albon because I think he hauled that car into places it didn't belong. You know, on our previous podcast, Rating the Drivers, he's well inside the top 10. You know, looks looks like the real deal now. So I think they benefited hugely from his ability and also him just being more comfortable in that environment and able to push the team on. And also flattered by the teams around them underperforming. You know, I think Williams did well to not regress as teams like Alfa Romeo did like Haas did, like Alpha Tauri did for most of the season, or at least they didn't improve. And then I think as as particularly Alpha Tauri got themselves into gear towards the end, then Williams found things more difficult. So yes, B on results, but I'm not sure how much of the progress comes from the team itself. I feel like the cars around them relatively got worse, and I think Albon... Without Albon, they would have had a much, much less impressive season. It is a, it is all relative, and and ultimately, 
a bad season for the other teams can potentially flatter Williams. But it's also worth pointing out that Alpha Tauri point at the end. That was also deep into the period where Williams didn't touch the car, which was a conscious decision to make sure it wasn't compromising itself longer term. And at the point at which Alpha Tauri really stepped up, so before they went on their point scoring run, I'm pretty sure Williams wasn't far off um, having outscored the other three teams combined behind them. There was a point where I think Williams was on about 21 points and the other three teams had about 24 between them. Yes, you're right. So when you get to uh, Monza, which obviously was one of the Williams circuits, so they scored six points in Monza, which put them on 21. And at that stage, Haas had 11, Alfa Romeo had 10, having scored one point in Monza, and Alfa Tauri had three. So actually they, they yeah. were just three points shy of, of yeah. four points shy of outscoring all of those teams. I, I, and when you then factor in that then over the rest of the thing, you've got the Alfa Tauri rate of upgrade, you've got the Haas big upgrade that comes um, in, in Austin as well. Alfa Romeo kept including the, uh, in, improving, improving the car and Williams didn't. And yeah, they had to hang on. So the performances did drop off in those last races. But it's about... you. When you're a backmarker or you're a team that has to be opportunistic, your season is judged on did you grab your opportunities when you when they presented themselves, and then did you do a better and then relative to others, did you do a better job of grabbing those opportunities? Because I don't think if you look at with the exception of Haas, I think because Haas was just almost universally rubbish on Sundays yes. <laughs> through the course of the season. Apart from that maybe Singapore very, with Magnussen, I think he was okay. Very wasn't he? little. But there's very little to separate a Williams and Alpha Tauri and a Sauber in terms of, right, how, if you looked at it at the start of the year, how many points do you think is actually going to be on offer? Or if you reflected on their year, rather, it's probably a better way of putting it, because I, I do think we all thought Williams would be worse than this at the start of the year. And if you look back on those, those seasons, you've got a clear run of races where the Alpha Tauri is in contention to score a decent chunk of points. You've got a run in the middle of the season where Williams is in contention to score a decent run of points. And you've got a Sauber situation where probably every fifth race they might score points because that just seems to be what that team does. And actually on reflection, Williams did, on balance, do the best job out of those. So I, I do think it is largely results-led and underperformance of other teams definitely comes into it. But if you look at how they played the season as a whole, the conscious decision that they made to make life harder for themselves in the second half of the year and they still did enough, I think that's why it's an above-average season versus my expectations for them. Yeah, that's a good argument, I think. They uh, they they did maximise their opportunities better, I would say. Like they, they, know, they know very well the performance profile of the car, and it's got quite obvious strengths and weaknesses, and I, I feel like mostly they did maximise those. And I guess that's what swung it in the end, because when they had the chance to score relatively big, they did. And then they clung on the rest of the time. And the other teams, when they had their best opportunities, maybe didn't quite get the absolute most of it. Obviously, Sonoda, you know, had he made a different decision in Mexico, the championship swing would have been different there. So that's one example of that driver line not quite getting the most out of what was a very good car. Whereas, I mean, the driver line at Williams didn't, but Alex Albon did. And also, we should note, Albon's part of the team. Drivers are part of this rating effectively as well because they're the ones that exploit the performance. Oh, we're rating the drivers again, are we, Ed? Oh, okay. No, they're just, they're just part of the team. So <laughs> it can't be completely separated for the purposes part of Part of the so team's like, season exactly, as well. Exactly, exactly. So they're all part of the, the whole equation that we're trying to weigh up. Well, let's move on now to Alpine that finished six. Ben, we've given them a D minus. Yeah, very disappointing season overall, I think. I mean, if we cast our minds back to the end of 2022, okay, Fernando Alonso, that whole situation was was disappointing for them. But they looked like the best place midfield team to break through. They had a car that was racing with Mercedes, uh, genuinely, quite a few places. And obviously Mercedes were having a relatively stronger time, I think, too. But they just didn't kick on. So, yes, you have some impressive peaks like Ocon's Monaco podium, the each car qualifying and finishing fourth in Vegas, um, and Gasly's podium at Zandvoort in the wet. But those were exceptions, I think, not the rule. And by the end of the season, marginal top 10 car at best. So where where do they go from here? Gasly says the car is quite well balanced, but just lacks overall load. Last season, they seem to have quite impressive rate of upgrades and te- seem to make proper steps in performance each time this season I I mean you might correct me but it didn't seem like they were so successful in pro- in progressing the car obviously 
Bruno Fernandes says that they got better at execution in the second half of the season and responding to deficits like Monza and turning around performance on that kind of track to Vegas, for example. So there are there are sort of a, a few bright spots, but I think overall much fewer of them. The management up, upheaval obviously was a big thing. Now they're moaning about the engine having a deficit. That, that wasn't really a concern last season, as far as I can remember. So I just worry that we've we've entered another bust phase of the sort of typical rapid boom and bust cycle that's typical of this team. The fact they've been overhauled by Aston and McLaren ultimately makes it you know a very disappointing season. But weirdly, they were actually closer to third than they were last season in terms of points scored. So in terms of their own objective, which was to be closer to third, they sort of half achieved that. But obviously that was on the expectation that they would be fourth again, not dumped down to sixth. So because of that, you have to say it's an abject failure of a season, really. Well, Scott, if you want to look at their gentle improvement they've made, they were at 4.75 points per event in the first half of the year over 12 races, then up to 6.3 in the 10 after the break. Now, that is an improvement. Does that get you very excited about Alpine's trajectory? No, it just tells me that you seem to be a paid-up member of the Bruno Faman fan club. <laughs> he claimed that they were scoring more points per weekend. I thought I'd better check that, and they did. But it, it's it's the classic thing, isn't it? Your growth percentage can sound great, but if it's from a low number to another low number, that's not actually that good. Yeah, I think it, I think they do deserve credit for for that because ultimately, like, uh, it, yes, it's again, it's all relative, and it's not a particularly impressive tally to have to have imp- improved to. But if you look at the course of the season, ultimately they did start the year ahead of McLaren. So they've been overhauled by McLaren through the season, but they've still increased their points output. So they've either done a better job in execution, they've done a better relative development job than, say, an Aston Martin, so they've been able to snipe the odd point more here and there, or a bit of both. And I think it is a bit of both. So it, it wasn't a season without high points. Obviously, podiums for, for, for each driver was a, was probably something not on the cards um, a few races into the campaign. It was actually something that was missing from their... In, otherwise very impressive 2022 season but it did just feel like again ben alluded to it but the, that it's that reset isn't it within the, the the renault works team cycle good season bad season people get sacked or replaced good season probably comes next year or the year after but it won't mean anything it won't it won't be the confidence inspiring yes this is it renault's finally going to break out of that midfield malaise it, it, it's just not there's it's too predictable that this kind of thing will happen. And it was disappointing because last year it did feel like they'd got a good handle on the regs. They were introducing upgrades. Upgrades were working pretty much straight away. Everything seemed to improve the car. And that didn't happen this year. They were quite disappointed. They were more reliable though, weren't they? That's probably the only thing you would say. Yeah. Last year they were very unreliable. 2023 they were... They were more solid, not not Baku, yes. obviously, but apart, apart from they that, they were more reliable. But they still had, they still did have too many problems. Yeah, exactly. As Esteban Ocon will uh, tell you at last. And, and and it's one of those, and it's another example of exactly what Ed was saying. If you start from that low base, just because you do better, doesn't mean you're doing a good job. It just means you're doing a less terrible job than yes. than before. <laughs> so they're still very much in. Um, they're still within touching distance in that midfield fight, and it's not like they've been absolutely left for dead by the you know McLaren or Aston Martin but they've been overhauled they've been overhauled emphatically the other two teams have done something that Alpine have just have not been able to do and they're in danger of being left behind so 2023 was a very bad season in terms of their own expectations but also what it says about where that organization is heading and the trajectory and any attempt at building momentum on in 2022 which which was actually a good season yeah the bottom line is we need to see more from Alpine and first and foremost, we need to see proof that the ownership is going to actually let that team really do what it can do. There's good quality people there, there's potential there, but it's been treading water for far too long. So, yeah, not good enough, really. Let's move on now to Aston Martin, who we've given a B. And at this point, we can start feeding a little bit of Mark Hughes, who was originally going to join us for this podcast, but then wasn't able to, but has recorded a few quick summaries of the top five teams. So let's hear from him on Aston Martin. There was an element of Aston being flattered by Ferrari and Mercedes staying with flawed concepts, but it's to Aston's credit that it got the basic concept right, even if it did owe a lot to Red Bull thinking in the first year that um, ex-Red Bull Dan Fallows had overseen the conception of the car. 
and the expectation was that it would be a step on from the 22 car and continue the team's steady progress towards the front. But it ended up far more than that. And for the first six races of the season, it was genuinely the second second best car on the grid. And Fernando Alonso converted that potential into heavy points. Um, a victory in Monaco, which came close to happening, would have been real fairy tale stuff. They didn't quite pull it off. But the fact that they were in a position to tells you everything about how much stronger they were than expected. Uh, subsequently, of course, the car lost that early season edge. It was overshadowed by Ferrari, McLaren and Mercedes in the post-Spain, really. But if we're calibrating the overall performance to preseason expectations, yeah, I'd say it was uh, a great season. Well, Scott, obviously a positive appraisal from Mark there. I guess the big problem is if you judge them on the first half of the season, they'd have been an emphatic A, wouldn't they? And it was just that overall trajectory that knocks them down a little bit. Still a net positive season, but perhaps not as positive as it could have been. Uh, yes, and also if you judge them at the end of 22 versus the end of 2023, there's no way you'd be saying this was a negative season at all. They scored more than four times as many points as they did last season. Obviously, they had Alonso's eight podiums or whatever it was. So um, it was a it, it was a clear step forward. Um, but I said this a few times through the year, and actually the likes of Mike Crack at Aston Martin agreed with me. Um, narr- narrative and, and momentum it, it is a thing and it is important and if you start if Aston Martin had started the year the way they ended it and then f- ended the year the way they started it you're having a McLaren discussion you're like wow look at this they've really got their act together and for Aston Martin it would have been even more impressive because it would have been a continuation of last year's improvement as well so you'd have had two full years of just constant improvement from being last in the championship to being regular podium finishers and fighting for Red Bull so it is a disappointment and it is it's a blot on the copybook which is why it's I'm happy with it being a B but it's not an A season or anything like that because they weren't able to take advantage of the opportunity that presented itself earlier in the year and it might have been unreasonable to expect them to stay ahead of Mercedes and Ferrari I'm fine with that I didn't think it would be a failure if Aston Martin slipped to fourth Uh, even if they had a bit more aerodynamic testing opportunities because of their position in the championship in 2022. But to have fallen behind McLaren the way that they did, to have been overhauled with the points margin that they had a a third of the way into the year, and then also become vulnerable to Alpine or Alpha Tauri on their their best weekends in the final rounds of the season as well, that that does detract from the... I, I accept that there are a lot of good things. And if you take a broad overview which is what Crack was kind of saying in Abu Dhabi. If you take a broad overview, there's no negatives. We got way more points than last year. We scored podiums. We proved that we have the capacity to start the year one of the best teams. I'm fine with that. I I don't disagree with that. But, and I got Crack to admit this as well, you zoom in and you find problems. It's not just the development rate, but there are also some annoying, niggling reliability problems that did genuinely afflict Stroll's side of the garage more than Alonso's side. Of, of the garage and it kind of unraveled a little bit through the year so I'm fine with it being a good grade but it can't be a top grade because it, it, it wasn't that through the season. No, I think that's fair and obviously trajectory is important because your development rate reflects your understanding and your knowledge and if you're butting up against a lack of knowledge and understanding in something then that shows a weakness as well so that, that's the big question for me with Aston Martin it may be they start next season very strongly and that almost cast a more positive light on what happened in 23 because that was part of the progress but yeah some some questions there for that team to ask but a lot of a lot of positives overwhelmingly a uh, a good season certainly just not perhaps quite what it could have been should we move on to McLaren now who we gave a B plus to again let's hear from Mark Hughes on McLaren they already knew its launch spec car wasn't going to be competitive and it wouldn't. we wouldn't see the real potential until the second phase of its development could be incorporated into it uh, the realization, so the realization was already there. It was going to be a potentially tricky season, uh, but from the outside, it was only natural to ask, "What if the new car failed to live up to its potential?" You know, the the, the updated car, and um, that could have brought all sorts of long term difficulties, especially with Lando Norris, one of the hottest properties on the driver market. But the update was everything the team had hoped for, and maybe even more. Um, from Austria up to Qatar, quite late in the season, it was usually a faster car than Ferrari or Mercedes, and so it became the nearest thing Red Bull had to a challenger. Um, so that season, with a, a pretty woeful first part, 
but a sometimes dazzling latter part. It was a much more exciting way for the team to place fourth in the constructors than just a steady fourth best throughout. It, it promises good things for the future, puts them on a good trajectory. Well, Ben, when it comes to McLaren, it's just the whole story, this turnaround from no hope to snapping at Red Bull's heels. I must admit, I was a little bit sceptical because it's rare for teams to make such a big step forward. But that's the big positive, isn't it? They were, they said, we're not going to do very well early on. We're going to have a transformative upgrade, which is going to work, and we're going to be really upbeat about it. And then it delivered, which is quite rare. So that could have gone very badly, couldn't it, if the upgrade didn't work as hoped. So that's that's a huge positive, and I guess that's why McLaren gets that B+, plus, that slightly higher ranking than uh, than Mar- Aston Martin does. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could argue that they should be even slightly further separated because that trajectory and that progression that Scott was talking about in the Aston segment, that's what McLaren have. I was extremely sceptical. I I thought that it was admirable they were so honest about how rubbish they were going to be at the start of the season. And considering they where they where they'd finished in twenty two and you thought, oh that's that's really disappointing. Like that maybe this whole season's going to be a write off and they said, oh well we aim to be competing to be fourth best by the end of the season. And by the end of the season... Fourth fastest car was what yeah, they wanted, was it? which four, was a very nice little like niche. It was a, it was a lovely niche. little asterisk to put on the, the fourth best. And of course, <laughs> by Abu Dhabi, that's what it was. It was the fourth best car in Abu Dhabi, probably overall, if you take in the race as well. But of course, up to that point, they were po- there were portions of the season, substantial portions, where they had the second best car comfortably. So they overachieved... Delivered as predicted and overachieved, and I think there's a lesson there in uh, setting expectations lower and then over delivering rather than setting them too high and under delivering, which is the case with a lot of teams. If you'd like a number on it, across the last six events, they were on average the fourth fastest car. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense because I mean Ferrari and and Mercedes got their acts together, particularly Ferrari, I would say, and. That's the other thing that I think really helped Aston not to go too far back to Aston. But, you know, they capitalised when Ferrari and Mercedes were having embarrassing starts to the season, really. And then as they they came on strong, Aston didn't really go anywhere. They made a big mess and then saved themselves from that for the final few events. But fell back, as Scott said, towards the kind of Division 3 territory. Alpha Tauri, you know, Alpine were snapping it. Aston by the end McLaren didn't have any of that they they were making progress all the way through and look like they have the potential to take now they look like they're in the Alpine position of 2022 can they take the big step on and and properly crack the code at the front maybe I mean very strong profile at high speed so they they seem to have found good downforce productive downforce in the, the tough part of the ride height range that James Allison talks about but they need to get more efficient. You know, they were messing around with rear wings and they struggled at places like Spa where they could be quick, but then they didn't have the right balance for the whole lap through a race distance. They need to get their low speed performance up. They need to make the car easier to drive as well. I think they relied a lot on the the very, very high ability of Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri. I think that's the other thing that makes a big difference for McLaren. And again, you could separate them slightly further from Aston for this. The second driver contributed a lot more, even though that second driver was in his first year of Formula One, whereas Lance Stroll didn't maximise the Aston when it was at its best. He didn't have an awful season, but he scored far few too many points compared to Alonso. And Aston really should have been fourth in the championship instead of McLaren, I think, considering where they started the season. I was just going to say the, um, the 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 main way I would put a bit more breathing space between McLaren and Aston would be to, the main argument I would make would be knock Aston down a little bit as their grade rather than bump McLaren up. So it would be Aston to a B minus, for example. If you, I think you could make a case for that because McLaren can't McLaren can't be higher than a B. B plus is fine, but it can't be higher than the B because it spent a th- it spent a third of the season underperforming. It, it, it before that Austria upgrade. Yes, the Baku upgrade was a nudge in the right direction and it worked and it showed that certain things were potentially coming, but it was a third of the season that they spent really really poor. And you and and it's not just it's not recency bias when they then spent two thirds of the season being good, but you do ha- you can't just ima- forget that that first part of the season happened and. As good as that sec, the second two thirds of the season were, it still ultimately added up to a season that was only marginally better than 2021. Like if you look back to 2021, the peaks there, they won a race, but the points tally, I think they only scored, um, a, they definitely scored more this season. But it wasn't, 
it wasn't a dramatic um, amount more because they they had a very good 2021 season and obviously there were fewer races but 2020 as well so it wasn't like it was a dramatic improvement on what we've seen from McLaren in the past it was just an improvement on where they ended 2022 so you got to factor that in as well and on the Aston Martin point uh, in terms of should McLaren have beaten them in the championship or not there is also the argument that as I say they did spend two-thirds of the season with a much better car than they had in the first third of the year and I would actually argue they spent more of the season with a better car than Aston than Aston spent with a better car than McLaren so if you look at it that way actually McLaren should have finished ahead of Aston Martin in the championship so there are elements of the season and that's not to detract from the turnaround because the turnaround was immense it's probably the best turnaround I've ever seen in Formula One Um, I'm sure if you go if you go back before my time because my time is not particularly expansive but but there will be other examples of it but I can't think of one not in the hybrid era certainly I think you do have to go back quite a bit, probably to McLaren in 2009 would be my pick for the last time there was an in-season turnaround quite like this and even that wasn't necessarily as dramatic as this given the wider context so there were lots of things about it that were very impressive it's just I'm just trying to sort of layer in a bit of context as to why you can't say that this was an absolute stunning season it can't be an A because of the reasons that I outlined. The one other thing I would very quickly mention, which would be really to just reinforce something Ben said, because I agree with it, is that one of the most impressive things from McLaren this season under Andrea Stella was the way that they mapped out the season in terms of expectations and then actually delivering on them because it was Stella who decided, right, at the launch, we will be honest. We will say we've missed what we wanted to start the season with. We will say that we're going to start the season in a weaker place and we will say it will take time for us to turn this around. But when they did that, when they did start to deliver on things like the Baku upgrade, which wasn't even the result of the technical restructure that Stella instigated, Stella's tune changed slightly ahead of the Austria upgrade. He was happy not to promise the world with it, but to let on how big it was and to, and to basically in, imply how confident they were that this was not just going to be a big visual change, it was going to be an effective one too. And I liked that because it it didn't go into over-promising, but there was a confidence about it. And they, and they did deliver on it. So there was, a for me, a fundamental change in the way McLaren went about its uh, development expectations and delivering on them this season. It was, it was a clear difference to how they've done that before. Yeah, it all comes down to a good command of what they're doing, why they're doing it, and understanding of the performance characteristics of the car that's in development. That's very, very positive for McLaren, certainly. Let's move on to Ferrari now, of course, who finished third in the championship. We've given them a C. Let's hear from Mark Hughes first. It can only count as a disappointing season for Ferrari. Its expectations pre-season were certainly that we'd be fighting for the title, given that they'd fixed the year's age problem, which had obliged them to turn the PUs down for much of 2022, costing them, they claimed, around three-tenths of a second. Um, but some tweaking of the same basic outwash car brought with it a rear instability at high speed, which spooked the drivers, even Charles Leclerc. Um, its tyre usage meant it often wasn't as competitive a race car as a qualifying car. It was quick over one lap, but it's six, six pull positions is not to be sneezed at. And, of course, it took the only Red Bull the non-Red Bull win of the season, courtesy of that Carlos Sainz drive in Singapore. But the team found itself trying to get round the limitations of the car, its tyre usage, its high-speed traits, rather than being able to just press on with making it faster. And so from being a team which for the first part of 22 could race and occasionally beat Red Bull and even briefly look, looking like a title contender, 23 can only be looked upon as a disappointment. But at least in the last few races of the season, they did seem to have a good handle on their car and had worked out its idiosyncrasies and, and could get the best from it. Well, Scott, Mark's quite positive about the progress Ferrari made in terms of getting the most out of their car. Do you agree it was sort of a, a, a gently positive season in terms of the overall result wasn't what you'd expect for Ferrari? But again, we've talked about trends and trajectory. There's some encouragement, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And I think that's what ultimately bumps it up from being... Um, a sort of slightly more negative um, uh, grade. I think there's also an element of, regardless of the, regardless of how they ended last year or, or, or how they were in 2022, as for the most part, Red Bull's biggest challenger, and the job that they did um, 
over the winter to then put themselves in a position to be saying we're expecting a title challenge and blah, blah, blah. Big changes, all of this. I still don't think Ferrari necessarily engenders the same confidence externally, right? And you can get carried away thinking about it, and maybe we did as well at the start of the year, and you're kind of thinking, well, they got fairly close last year in the first part of the season. Maybe this year they'll make a step forward and um, turn that into a proper title challenge. But I, I don't really think anyone necessarily buys into that because they haven't won a title in so long. So when we talk about Mercedes specifically in a, in a moment, but I feel like that just puts a slightly different expectation on Ferrari at the start of the year. I, do I do I think Ferrari should be fighting for the title? Yes. Am I actually going into the season expecting them to? No. So when they only then end up fighting for second in the championship, for me that just feels like less of a failure for Ferrari because it's just a bit closer to my natural expectation for them anyway and then the way that they did that through the year was actually quite good in terms of weaknesses at the start of the year some quite concerning familiar weaknesses as well but just gradually getting on top of different things ending the year with a better car than they started with all all, things like this and that's why I feel like it's a yeah that's fine it's kind of par for the Ferrari course there were some things that were better than in the past and some things that were worse but it kind of averages out as, yeah, that's kind of what I expect from Ferrari, really. Yeah, that's a big question with Ferrari, isn't it, Ben? It's the question of, can they actually sustain this promise and progress, or they just sort of go up and down and up and down as they have so often for the past 15 years now? Yeah, it's just the same concern you have is uh, that they started the new rules so strongly. Like, There's no way 2023 can be considered anything other than a disappointment when they won so many races in 2022. They were genuine title contenders for a while. Okay, that se- the wheels came off that season completely. And there was obviously massive upheaval behind the scenes and Bonotto booted out and the clerk unhappy, etc. I would say the positive is the team feels calmer now. It does seem like the clerk's happier. It does seem like for once, and this is the big difference to 22, they seem to be able to get on top of the car they had. You know, they did. They were able to calm it down. They were able to make it more drivable. They were able to make it more to the clerk's liking in a way that he then wouldn't smash it into the barriers at a moment's notice. And they finished the season quite strongly. You know, he was qualifying well, often the second fastest behind Verstappen in certain places. Obviously, Vegas was amazing. So that that is good. But nevertheless, they started the season much further behind than they should have done. They didn't really seem to understand how to build on what they had in 2022 they they chased straight line performance improved it but lost a load of grip made the car really peaky and hard to drive a bit like the mclaren drivers i think science and the clerk had to work really really hard for what they were able to get out of it and yes okay they 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 clawed some of it back you know, the austria update seemed to give them a bit more of direction then monza they seemed to really twig how the car worked when they bought that super low drag package and then they were able to maximise the car in that kind of configuration. So there were some bright spots, but I mean, you know, that's kind of what Williams does, have a low drag car that they maximise in certain places. And Ferrari, with all of their resources and their prior success, etc., shouldn't really be, be judged against that kind of ability. You know, they should be able to do far, far more with what they have at their disposal. So I give them a little bit of leeway because of the whole change in regime and you need Obviously, Fred Vasseur needs time to course correct the culture and get the team working the way that he needs. I think he's probably made faster progress on that score than I expected. I felt at the start of the season when they were so far off where they needed to be. And there was you know, the story of Sanchez leaving to join McLaren and other people maybe on the way out and some discomfort on the, the shop floor at the way everything was handled at the end of 2022. I thought, how is he? how is he going to pull this thing together? But to be fair to him... As the season wore on, certainly in the in the last sort of six seven races, I felt like his Ferrari was starting to show through, and that gives me a bit more confidence heading into next year. You know, they they've got Leclerc, presumably now locked down for the long term, happy, got the car to his liking. He can now exploit it again. It's now just finding a way, as Mark was talking about, to widen that performance window. You know, they need to. They've exhausted this concept. Clearly, it. It wasn't the right one in terms of development. They didn't know how to develop it in 22. They sort of figured out how to make it work okay in 23, but they need a change of direction to kick on and be back to where they should be. 
Ed, quick question for you before we wrap up on Ferrari. What's the value of the... I know Mark mentioned this, but what is the value of the only non-Red Bull win of 2023? That's got to have a little bit of... Put a bit of shine on the season, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it nudges you up a little bit. It doesn't fundamentally change the performance of your car, but it's a good example of how you've managed to extract performance. And obviously that was a tricky win to take. So yeah, it, it's a good thing for Ferrari not to have a winless season, just as it's a bad thing to have a winless season. <laughs> yes. And also, I think, is it fair to say, I I know what I think about this, but the two of you just very quickly, Ferrari's not winning that race in the first half of the year, is it? No, I don't think so. No, Aston, Aston probably wins that race, doesn't it, in the first half of the season? Yeah, probably. And, and I think it reflects the fact that Ferrari had really understood its car and how to get the most from it which is a big part of a team's job ultimately so but yeah positive from their perspective they managed to really thread the needle which is what it was well, there was a bit of clinging on as well wasn't there because mclaren were strong there mercedes were coming fast mercedes it's, could easily have won that race yeah the tire management thing was still a weakness like, i think that the bedrock of that success was obviously the clerk playing rear gunner sacrificing his race overheating his car and then going slow they were going slower than logan Sargent for lap after lap until the safety car just to protect the tires and that set that set them up then because they weren't running the usual deficit. I don't think they've really nailed that. That's another ongoing, almost endemic weakness that they need to address for next year, I think. Whereas, you know, McLaren, they bought an update in Singapore that was specifically designed to to mitigate tyre tire degradation and seem to make step, steps in that area. I'm not sure Ferrari have. I think they've made the car easier to drive, which means the drivers are then better at looking after the tyres, but I think they've still got some of the, the pre-existing challenges they need to conquer for next year. So although Singapore was a nice gloss on the year, there are obviously very particular circumstances as well as Red Bull disappearing for one weekend that made that possible. And considering the success they enjoyed at the start of 2022, you know, the global picture is a clear backward step for Ferrari, although there are reasons to be cheerful. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Talking of wins versus no wins, let's get on to Mercedes now, who we've given a C- as opposed to a straight C for Ferrari. Let's hear from Mark Hughes. Mercedes narrowly beat Ferrari to second place in the Constructors' Championship. I'd argue they they had an even more disappointing season than Ferrari. Um, Failing to win a race for the first time in 12 years, the concept that kept faith in it just didn't work. And worse even than that, every time it looked like they'd made progress, there'd be a race like Brazil where they were nowhere. So even late into the season, they were still capable of being blindsided by this car. It had its good points, the right medium speed corner corner speed range it was pretty good, and it could treat its tyres well in a stint. But they were just crumbs from the table, really. It was a terribly disparate season, and one which will have shaken the team to its core. Well, Ben, obviously Mark's quite negative there in terms of the erraticness, the peakiness of this Mercedes that was all over the place, even sometimes within weekends, it seemed to be all over the place for one driver and manageable for the other. So that's kind of the story of the season for them, isn't it? Yeah, I I mean, obviously their, their season is a disappointment in terms of expectation because like Ferrari, they didn't fight for the title when they were expecting to. You could say fairly maybe that expectation was more unrealistic for Mercedes considering their performance the season before but in 2022 they seem to be making this progression the kind of progression that we've been talking about with McLaren you know understanding the car making it relatively faster obviously they finished really quite strongly with the one two in Brazil particularly and that obviously helped convince them to keep playing the same furrow and turned out to be the wrong thing to do I think they've definitely taken a almost worse backward step than Ferrari because of this inconsistency. You know, 2022, it seemed like they, even though the car was bad, they seemed to be getting an increasing hand on it. Whereas this season, they just never really seemed to hit that. They were There's this odd moment, like Hamilton's last stint in Mexico and the Austin performance where they bought the four upgrade, where you think, oh, okay, yeah, this is coming together now. This gives you a sense of understanding for Mercedes heading into 24 and then they go to Brazil where they were so successful and they were useless like really really awful performance and it it saps all the confidence that maybe you have that they really know what they're doing so I think next year huge pressure on them you know James Allison has outlined as you'd expect quite eloquently where the mistakes are made what I find quite strange is that they were obviously 
massively affected by porpoising in 2022. And that was a big, big problem for them. They pushed hard for changes to the rules to as close as possible eliminate that, certainly mitigate it. And then when it came to exploiting those rules and trusting that those changes would deal with the main problem they had, they reversed out of that and went too cautious and decided to keep kind of doing the same thing they'd been doing the year before, which, yeah, okay, had yielded some results, but I I would have expected them to be a bit more aggressive. And the fact they weren't is quite disappointing. And I guess having understood that, you know, James Allison's job is to now try and bring a whole organisation that must be very low on confidence after this season together and start to get them to look in the right places again. Um, You know, races like Brazil, performance, yes, very disappointing, but also just the lack of execution there. You know, have we seen Toto Wolff as stressed as he's been this season? Probably not since Nico Rosberg and Hamilton were going at it in that team. You know, he'd be worried about the fact that when they looked at that weekend, even if they'd had more track time, not had the sprint weekend format, they wouldn't have known how to get the car working. And that is not what you expect you know, with three races to go or whatever it was in the season from a team that's, you know, won as many championships as Mercedes. The bottom line is, Scott, that this team hasn't convinced us that it really is completely on top of the understanding of the demands of these regs and how to achieve them. I think they know what they want to achieve, but the fine detail of how to do it and the tools necessary to do that is still a question mark. Yes, I think that's a fair way of putting it. Um, I would say that... It, it kind of the inverse of what I was saying about Ferrari. It is a more disappointing season because of the hope and expectation I had for them going into the start of the year. I, I really thought Mercedes would get a good step closer to to beating Red Bull, um, not not look further away. Um, and I, I completely accept that they they might well be confident in where where those missteps occurred and and, and why and the the different things that they're doing for next year the different processes and way of working that they have to make sure that this doesn't happen again and it will be third times the charm in the I'm more I'm I'm perfectly happy still giving them the benefit of the doubt because I think the currency that they banked in the sort of the dominant era of the the the, the very many titles across different rule sets and you know showing that they they weren't just a one trick pony they they were able to design cars to different rule sets and still win um I think that is worth more than what they've lost over the last two seasons. But obviously, it's they've they've lent, they've, they've made made a lot of withdrawals from 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 that account over the last couple of years. So, um, I think there's there is there is a lot to prove in 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 this rule set. But still, I still I still don't disbelieve in them. It's just versus where I was at at the start of this year, I had higher expectations. So it is a it's more of a failure their season, even though they beat Ferrari in the championship, which I think you can pull out different points from every drive, every one of the four drivers' seasons over the year and say, oh, yeah, but Ferrari would have got it if Sainz hadn't had the problem in Vegas. But then also you say, well, Mercedes would have got it if Russell hadn't had the, the engine failure in Australia and, and, and all stuff like this. You can always pull different things out. I think it was more of a failure just because I had higher, I had higher expectations for Mercedes this year. And I think for most most of the season they they were executing better than the teams around them in terms of races brazil no but early in the season i don't think they they had the second fastest car there were rarely points where they looked like they did you know maybe spain obviously hamilton got pole in hungary but other than that they tended to look like they were behind one or more of the teams around them but they just they managed to get the results thanks to obviously lewis hamilton having quite a steady season in terms of race performances and george russell doing okay okay as well I, f- I i feel like this team peaked in 2020 if i'm honest you know they threw so much into that car chasing that ghost of the, f- the ferrari engine that then wasn't allowed to be and and i think that took so much energy from the organization and then plus obviously some key personnel started to drip out you know through the covid period that then what they've been able to do so impressively through the the big rule change at the early part of the hybrid era you know, when the, when F1 went back to big or went to big, you know, super steroid aero cars in 17, they were so impressive in managing to maintain their position on top through that big rule shift. But the, the COVID carryover, that did nix them. And although it was obviously a close fight with Red Bull, they weren't, they weren't as impressive as they had been. And then, 
it just seems to have kind of snowballed and now we've gone into another major rule set and they just they've just looked lost and now we we wait that's why i think it's so disappointing because you expect so much having proven that they can get from one being dominant under one set of rules to still being successful through another for them to go from being championship contenders and constructors championship winners to kind of not really at the races for the past two seasons is massively disappointing so there's huge pressure now on on the rejig team under allison to kind of get things back on track Let's round off now by talking about Red Bull. I think it'll be no surprise to anyone that they've got an A-plus from us. Not much more you can do, but let's hear from Mark Hughes. Even they didn't expect the level of dominance they had this season. Um, Just like the rest of us, they assumed the others would be closing the gap despite Red Bull's ongoing development. But because the basic concept of the car had been so right in 2022, they were able to just add downforce to it and retain a similar balance. To, to that which they'd found in the latter part of last season so then when Verstappen worked out how to fine tune it better and really exploit it with the cockpit tools after he, he was defeated in uh, Baku by his teammate Perez they, they were even further clear because he he was able to just really stretch out the potential of the, the car and then you know the, it was outside of Red Bull's control but both Ferrari and Mercedes found the limitations of their quite different concepts and so they were just in a constant loop of trying to correct basic shortfalls while the Red Bull just got faster and faster with the normal in-season routine development. Um, they stopped development quite early, actually, but they could afford to because such was their advantage. So, yeah, just absolutely resounding. Well, Scott, Mark there explained the almost virtuous circle that Red Bull were in. And there's just nothing really negative you can say about this team. The worst thing you can say about them is, oh, they didn't win one race. Oh, and they didn't win one sprint race. That that's pretty much tells you how astonishing the season's been. You, you, you can't really criticise it, especially considering the disadvantage they had in terms of the wind tunnel and uh, uh, CFD resources, thanks to that cost cap penalty from a few years ago. Well, well, they obviously... They managed to score, I think, was it double the points of the second team in the Constructors' Championship, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, And I think Verstappen also just managed to score double the points of Perez in second as well. Um, Well, they scored more than double the points of the two teams behind them put together, didn't they? If you add Mercedes and Ferrari together, they don't get close to beating Red Bull. uh, Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're, you're, you're right. Um, So you, you have a... Yeah, so you have a situation where they haven't just obviously won these championships. They've absolutely obliterated the opposition. And I think it was I think it was more impressive than it looked in some ways because there was just a point in the season, I think during Verstappen's record breaking run of consecutive wins, where it just looked easy. And obviously when you have that many wins, but like there's a reason that Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton never won this many races in a row. It's super hard to do, even if you have the best car. And bear in mind, there were quite a few qualifying sessions and races that were rain affected and complicated by by things like this. The sort of thing that could have easily tripped up team or driver. And if there was a more competitive teammate for Verstappen, maybe that would have happened. Maybe they'd have egged each other on into some kind of issue. Maybe they've had a they'd have had a Mercedes 2016 style implosion or something like that. But regardless, you you it's that. It's such a horrible cliche. You know, you can only beat what's in front of you and you can only handle what's in front of you. And the challenges were actually bigger than people probably assume, especially during that super successful run in the middle of the year. But just nothing. It, it, took, it took Singapore, which is, which is just the ultimate dominant F1 car killer. I think Singapore is just brilliant now. It's just, it's the one hope we all have. If, 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 if Singapore can catch out Red Bull in a season like 2023, nobody's safe from it. It's so a we, lovely we, little outlier. That's the good thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, with the exception of that weekend, nothing caught Verstappen and Red Bull out between them. And even that those first few races, if you'd have removed Perez from the picture, it's one of the things I feel slightly sorry about for Checo is that even the two races he won, he didn't make a difference because Verstappen would have won those races anyway. It would have been so lovely for him, wouldn't it? If like if he'd won a won even one race where had he not won that race, Red Bull would have lost. Do you know that that kind of thing? But that's just how good Verstappen and Red Bull were this season. They were they exceptional. I think Christian Horner has said they won't re- repeat a a season like this in his lifetime 
And I would be stunned if I ever see in my lifetime a season like this. And actually, to be honest, I hope I never do. <laughs> the thing that most impresses me, I think, is uh, how considering the toughness of the 2021 championship fight and how hard both Red Bull and Mercedes had to push that year in terms of development that they could do right to the end for Red Bull to come out the blocks under the new rules as strongly as they did but they they were a bit behind but they they managed to they managed to conceive their first car under these rules well and then this year they've just built on it so you've got you've got the development they probably would have liked to have done in advance this year instead of in 2022 but Mercedes counter to that uh counter to that is Mercedes and Ferrari have kind of let them off the hook, particularly Ferrari, because they didn't have the excuse of an epic 2021 title fight going into these rules, and they started strongly and just haven't gone anywhere with it. Mercedes, contrasting to Red Bull, extra disappointing in that you know they were in a similar position, but they've just they've almost been drowned by the the weight of work they've had to do to try and stay on top, and Red Bull have just been able to to come out that much stronger. And then this year with Mercedes not kicking on not abandoning the concept early enough and Ferrari having lost its way so badly trying to rebuild again it's kind of let Red Bull have a much easier ride through this season than they should have had in terms of the pressure to develop faster or harder or spend resources in a way that they otherwise wouldn't like they've had a free run at it basically and they've they've managed to chuck a load of development on in the winter of 22 that you know, they, they couldn't get round to doing in season because of the compound delay and they've they've done it this year started further ahead the others are not there to put them under pressure so they've just been able to tick over really this year and the worry is that it just cycles on so they've had loads of time even with the cost cap penalty to just think about RB20 Christian Horner's even said that they spent most of their time ploughing resources into the 2024 car so even if Mercedes and Ferrari get their act together they'll be facing a stronger Red Bull potentially than even this season, which is quite a frightening prospect. The bottom line is it's a phenomenal achievement to be in such a supreme position and to deliver so consistently. It's a bit of a shame they didn't get that full house of wins because they got so close, but yeah, just just missed out on it. And yeah, it's going to be a long time before a team has a season like that. The last one was 88 with McLaren. So uh, yeah, we're not due one for a good few years uh, yet, but yeah, just phenomenal from Red Bull. And I think... There's plenty of people who are always queuing up to knock down and criticise whoever's on top and almost blame them for it. And people have all sorts of reasons they can formulate for why it's in some way unfair. But it's just not. The reason Red Bull's on top and has dominated is they have been the best team in terms of understanding the demands of these regulations, making sound technical decisions, not just Adrian Newey, but through that whole organisation and executing superbly. Everyone in that organisation seems to know what they're doing and they seem to cohere brilliantly. And that's to the credit of everybody working there and the leadership. Well, thanks very much to Ben and Scott for your insight. Head to therace.com. Don't forget the hyphen, plenty to read there. Listen to our other podcasts, including Bring Back V10s, which tells classic F1 stories. We've got the Race F1 Tech Show with Gary Anderson and our MotoGP IndyCar and Formula E podcasts. Also, if video is your thing, take a look at our YouTube channel. Well, that's it for us for 2023, but we'll be back next year with everything you need to know from the world of Formula One. The Athletic.